yeah am i audible to everyone yes sir okay uh welcome to all the participants uh all clinicians and uh, my fellow colleagues in uh, joining us here for this uh, session on biomimetic dentistry uh before i go further i'll just check i think uh, is my video visible yes sir the display is fine the visuals and the audio is fine sir okay okay is is my camera also on uh, i think the camera is off sir okay i'll just get to that uh, and then we will uh, continue thank you for that introduction uh, dr shanuf okay. uh, and thank you for the invite to safe dental updates i think uh, you are doing a wonderful job of uh, getting such a platform for uh, you know clinicians and everyone to share uh, their knowledge uh, across for uh, clinicians all across the country and uh, many kudos to to you and the entire team uh, for finishing uh, 50 such presentations and uh, webinars it is a milestone uh, and it's a great start to the 51st i hope that it is equally well received and uh, fruitful to all the clinicians who are attending uh, here this this evening uh, i must compliment you all uh, we have uh, wonderful numbers that are joining in uh, for joining us in spite of it being a working day and uh, you know post clinical hours uh, it shows your interest and it also shows that the future of dentistry uh, within the country is something that is going to improve the standards are going to improve and we will all keep updating uh, based on the latest techniques and uh, materials that will be available to us yeah so this is uh, where we are at uh, biomimetic dentistry i think this is uh, something that has been uh, a very renowned topic okay something that has been in the chatter uh of late in the last 2 or 3 years and uh, there are multiple reasons and very positive reasons for it to be there uh it is receiving a lot of limelight for the right reasons as clinically it has been proven to be a very successful approach towards restorative dentistry uh through this lecture we'll definitely be getting into the nitty gritties of it and uh, i hope to update you all on certain techniques uh and simplify this very complex topic of restorative dentistry this is me in my practice uh i love working uh, using the microscope i am an exclusive microscope dentist and uh, this is where i practice at a small little clinic based in bombay but something that has all the gadgetry and you know something that gives me a lot of happiness as you can see in this photograph whenever i'm working on patients coming to my journey in biomimetic dentistry uh like possibly most of you all i also got to know of it uh, through social media through articles that were coming into publication and all i had at the end of you know getting to know of the terms was uh, simply of what is biomimetic dentistry i mean what are they going what is bio i was what is biomimetic and what are they trying to achieve the many many questions that were there that that just kept on continuing and all through i just went on my inquisitive mind okay my my quest for searching for answers the best place to go on today is is the internet searched researched a lot of articles did get a lot of answers but most of these answers were like individual jigsaw puzzles like you know individual pieces of jigsaw puzzle which gave me an idea but there was never a completion you know every arrow was was an individual arrow but how do we assimilate that information and get that together that is what it took me a, quite a long time a lot of research a lot of learning a lot of discussions and probably now i would say that you know there is some level at which i can understand uh, the concepts and the approaches the clinical approaches as well of biomimetic dentistry and through this lecture i would like to see that even you all have you know not only the individual jigsaw puzzles 
pieces, but also the jigsaw puzzle gets closer to each other. The individual pieces definitely get closer to each other as we embark on this journey of biomimetic dentistry. This is my basic uh, flowchart for today. Uh, just plain and simply speaking, under these three headings. So what basically is the difference between traditional and biomimetic dentistry? I would put that to compare it. It would be traditional dentistry is like that in the combustion engine. Okay, it's it's something that burns oil that has been there for about hundreds of years. It creates a lot of pollution, and that is in the uh, you know in the limelight of late. And similar to what we have done with amalgam, it's the mercury toxicity. It's something that people or our own patients are not really willing. There is enough of regulation that is coming off for taking off amalgam. And it is probably time to move off amalgam as the base of our dentistry. And I would compare biomimetic dentistry to an electric engine, something that has been in the works for the last 15, 20, 25 years, but is getting the right impetus because of engineering and the cost and the right evidence to come into the market and take us further. So this is the basic broad comparison that I would give. Specifically to speak about traditional dent dentistry, the major changes between traditional dentistry and biomimetic dentistry is that traditionally traditional dentistry goes according to the material. It's like, what, do, what does the material need? Accordingly, we'll prepare the tooth, we'll prepare the patient, and we just go on our approach that way. It's like a salesperson. You know, whatever the customer comes first is the mantra for salespeople. And that is what, you know, it, it always goes. But there are limitations in it. It does not give the patient or the patient or the tooth first. And in a restorative practice, restorations are encompassed or within a tooth. So the tooth, which is a few millimeters wide and a few millimeters deep, needs every small millimeter or micrometer to be preserved. I think that is the main difference uh, between that. And what has been, what has allowed that change from traditional dentistry to biomimetic dentistry, like in uh, uh, in the engines that I spoke about, it is the electronics and the semiconductors or the uh, the batteries that have changed. Uh, this has happened over here with adhesion, which was traditionally is retention based based on cements. Biomimetic dentistry is entirely based on adhesion understanding the, the, the principles of adhesion, understanding tooth as a substrate and the many layers of it, histologically as well as clinically. What exactly is biomimetics? It is nothing but studying the intrinsically and extrinsically the tooth, okay? And understanding materials that can help formulate or replace them. Same thing will apply to dentistry within a tooth. Okay, we preserve the intact tooth and we try and replace it with materials that are as similar in function as well as probably appearance as well, cosmetically, to the tooth. So then coming to the advantages, plain and simple advantages, technical advantages would be we've all seen patients or we've all done composites and had our fingers crossed for wanting not wanting the patient to call back with sensitivity or any pain or if it was a deep cavity not going into a pulpal reaction with pain and pulpitis or we dread seeing a tooth after a year with a, a periapical abscess when we felt that we did one of the best composite restorations so eliminating root canal search those are the advantages of biomimetic dentistry and I would say the, the best technical advantage is we maximize adhesion, the last point, is maximizing adhesion by 400%. So that gives us a margin of error. Even if you don't achieve that as 400%, even probably 50% of that, which could be an average clinical uh, number that we get to within the clinical environment, within the variations of clinical dentistry, even then we are well above the threshold of 100% adhesion. What exactly are then the goals of biomimetic dentistry? Simply, plainly speaking, we can categorize them as three. One which I've already mentioned is the tooth preservation. The most important among tooth preservation is pulpal vitality preservation. 
and then making it a mechanical monoblock or the mechanical considerations of allowing or replacing dead tooth or carious tooth material with replacement materials that act as a tooth itself, which is a difficult proposition. Coming to tooth preservation, we'll start with caries removal endpoints. So how do we approach caries for in a cavity? Biomimetic dentistry gives us two basic principles of caries removal. The, the first is approaching caries from the occlusal surfaces where we differentiate caries in enamel and caries in dentine. And one thing that we don't want to do is go and, uh, and create a pulpal lesion. So caries removal is always done via caries detector. These are nothing but basic red fusion, fusion dyes which stain denatured collagen, which is a part of infected dentine. It stains it red and pink. How do we apply it? We dry the tooth. We apply this copiously, allow it to set for 10 seconds, and then we wash it off. What remains is what we should take off. Now, what do we remove? Do we remove all of it? Not really. So the left, half, left side of this chart is what we remove. Okay, the, the red and all shades of darker red. But as we go lighter, we do not need to remove it because it is affected dentine. This is a very beautiful article given by Alamin and Magne, where they describe in detail the systematic approach to deep caries removal. Okay, and what are they what they term as caries removal endpoints? In this, they dif differentiate dentinal caries into outer caries and inner caries dentine. So in going with the whole concept of pulpal preservation is they've given good measurements for going deep. One thing that we have to always try and preserve is the pulpal vitality. So we do not expose pulp at any cost. I will be speaking a little bit about it later. So we want to remove the outer caries dentine only, but how much do we remove that? Okay, this is exactly the concept of preserving vital pulp. So you remember this is a clinical photograph of a cavity, basic cavity prep that is done and then a application of the caries detecting dye. After this, we wash it off and this is what remains. This entire thing is in dentine. How much do we remove of this? These dark areas is what we remove. The lighter areas is what we, we can keep removing. Okay, so this is where we end up at and then we can go a little bit further and try and remove a little bit further but how deep do we go these are the measurements that are being given okay for there are measurements which i'll come to for preserving the vitality and maintaining uh, the removal of caries then comes the concept of peripheral seal zone coming to the same picture the peripheral seal zone concept maintains that the entire enamel has to be free of caries. That is first. And secondly, the DEJ should also be free of caries. That is enamel and DEJ should be entirely free of caries. And about 1 to 1 1.5 mm of dentine, depending on which area of the tooth it, it is, or up to 2 millimeters of dentine should be free of caries. That is the peripheral seal. The whole idea is that once this is completely free of caries, the seal, that is the bonding that happens to this part is so strong that even if there is a little bit of caries, like that pink spots that are there in this on this tooth, even if it, that is there, that will then remineralize because the pulp is vital. So that is what biomimetic dentistry is. Understanding the tooth, using the tooth to our benefit and also understanding the adhesive process that we go on to. And this will, whether it is a occlusal caries or a proximal caries or any part of caries, this is all that is there. That the enamel has to be completely free of caries, the DEJ as well, no demineralized enamel as well at all. And then we go in for a 1.5 to 2 millimeters of absolutely clear dentine. The third concept of tooth preservation will be enamel preservation. What do you mean by enamel preservation? So enamel is something that the bonds of our adhesive dentistry are the most predictable, high, as well as long-term 
predictable. They, they do lo last you the longest. They do not degrade over time. So that is why the margins when placed in enamel, whether it is a cavity, whether it is a crown prep or an onlay prep, whatever, intracoronal or extracoronal restorations, we will always preserve, try and preserve enamel. And as in this case, there is an undermined enamel over here. Do we understand? And in traditional dentistry, what we would do? We would just extend it up to here. So that is something that is entirely incorrect. In biomimetic dentistry, we will just fill this up so it's that the undermined enamel is just supported by the restoration. Because in following the principles of biomimetic dentistry, we will be following that uh, in, in, in detail a little later. The bond of this dentin to the composite is stable enough to support this undermined enamel. So that then becomes a predictable restoration. So you're not removing this additional dent part because then you're thinning out the cusp that will lead to other failures. So understanding the tooth, using it to our advantage at all times. The other part of enamel preservation is quite contrary to the word preservation is beveling of enamel. These are occlusal bevels because this is of the orientation. This is like a histologic way of preparing enamel so that the enamel rods are not on end on etching. We are getting a much deeper bond to the enamel within the prisms and then that's contributing to the long-term success of, of bonding to enamel. So this is something that we need to do. How do we do that? We use something called a calillary burr, which is of the shape that is shown over there. And in an occlusal preparation, we'll just move it along the cable surface margins such that we it will form the same shape. Okay. Now, whether we go in for a short bevel or a long bevel, that's clinician's choice and depends on the tooth and also the occlusal factors. We do not want the margin to be in the bite. So that is something that we'll have to take a clinical call on. But this is something that is that needs to be done for all preparations, especially in the occlusion. So in this case, we're going by the same example. This is enamel preservations in the classroom. That if there is slight undermined or unsupported enamel over there, we will go and we will not go ahead and entirely remove it. But before even wedging, or going for a matrix band, we will we will just do a small little restoration over there such that the enamel does not break. And this is the preservation of enamel in the proximal box. Coming to pulp vitality, these are the clinical measures that will be that will, that are given by Pascal Magne and David Alleman. The first is a vertical depth or an corona apical depth of five millimeters from the cavo surface margin. This five millimeters is from the occlusal point of the cavity, the occlusal cavo surface margin to as deep into the cavity. At this measure, most tooth, unless it's a very young, a 16 year old, you know, permanent molar kind of a thing or a, or a premolar where you are having caries, which is quick caries in that case. So you have to take a clinical call, but in most instances, your perioprobe is your best friend to find that five millimeters. That is the measurement proposed by Pascal Magne and David Alleman. And for how much do we go axially? It's about three millimeters from the axial wall of the adjacent tooth, okay? Or five millimeters from the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth. So these are basic dimensions that are given. And what if there is caries remaining beyond that? We just let it be. Whether it is infected or affected dentin, it doesn't really matter because pulpal preservation is higher priority for, for preserving the vitality of the tooth and the ultimate bond over, uh, over that. So preservation of pulpal vitality is something that we always have to keep in concern. So how do we assess it? My clinical indicators are an X-ray. A bite wing plays a better role. Okay. So we know that in this case, which is a large carious lesion, uh, the pulpal horn recession allows us to give this a, a direct go. At the same time, we know that there is a lot more secondary dentine. So, min, so do we follow the 5mm? It's difficult to clinically follow the 5mm, but if it's only an occlusal cavity, then definitely this is a very useful way of uh, maintaining vitality and not having pulpal exposure. Well, speaking about pulpal exposure, we are all clinicians. And this is a case where this was probably before my biomimetic days. This is how we would approach it. 
This is a part of traditional dentistry. You see a large carious lesion here, which is affecting almost half the, half the tooth. This was again a young, young patient, something around 18 to 20, a student who would come in with, uh, you know, a restoration that was needed. Uh, he was having pain only on food getting stuck in the cavity. So that clearly shows that the tooth was vital. And uh, judging by the x-ray, you can see a good amount of secondary dentine and slight recession of the pulp horn. So these are things that are clear indicators that allow you to go for uh, a restorative procedure and not directly needed. A root canal is definitely not directly needed in this case. So I followed the principles of, uh, you know, caries detecting dye, trying to find a peripheral seal zone. And always important in the peripheral seal zone is we clean the, the periphery first and then approach going towards the center of the lesion. The periphery has to be clean first. It's like working as a surgeon. You have to clean out all the unwanted remnants, reduce the bacterial road from the cavity, and only then we proceed further. So as we do this, we, we get closer and closer, deeper to the, to the, uh, into the cavity. And that's what happened in my, in my, in this case. Okay. I wanted to take out all the pink, taking out all the pink. You can see how clean the cavity is, but there was clearly a pulpal exposure, a pinpoint exposure nonetheless, but a pulpal exposure. And judging by the uh, pre-op x-ray, we were absolutely correct in showing that it was not an inflamed pulp. So in this case, what did, what could I do? The best thing that I could do was place an MTA plug and follow it up with a glass ionom or restoration and then go ahead and restore it. This was a direct restoration. The tooth is doing absolutely fine. It's been two years, but this is not biomimetic restoration. This is what I'm trying to say. Uh, these are things that if you keep following, the removing the pink, this is where you're going to end. Okay, the, the pink does go towards the pulp, but the pulp's ability to withhold itself from the inflammation is something that we try and go on. So this is where you can see the MTA barrier placed over here and then the restoration. The role of pulp vitality in a tooth. Pulpal tissue is something that responds to all stimuli. That can be sensitivity, caries, trauma, or even food. So a heavy attrited tooth, or uh, the forces, the mechanical forces that are there. Preservation of the dental pulp allows for secondary and tertiary dentine. Now, secondary dentine is something that is formed throughout life, but in a carious tooth, tertiary dentine is something that forms a very important part of the tooth's journey. Preserving that pulpal vitality allows for formation of the reparative and tertiary dentine. So if there is future, uh, you know, caries into that tooth or some mechanical trauma, we still have a chance of going further into treatment. Secondly, once we go for endodontic treatment, the depth of the cavity from the occlusion to the pulpal or that is still here is extremely high. And that itself increases the flexure of the tooth. And we'll be uh, discussing in mechanical principles that as the flexure increases, the chances of fracture or mechanical instability of the tooth also increase. So that is where going into preserving the pulpal vitality is all that is there. So if we have a pulpal exposure, I think after this case, which I just showed you, there has been no restorative case that has had a pulpal exposure following the principles of caries removal, as stated by Magne and uh, David Alleman. And that's where we go into, you know, pulpal preservation mode. Coming to the mechanical uh, principles of biomimetic dentistry, we first understand the functional forces on the tooth. There are a couple of concepts that we'll need to understand this. The first is the compression dome concept. The compression dome concept is nothing but a dome that the tooth and the outer enamel, okay, although it is hard structure, when supported by the dentine internally, it acts as a dome. A dome is like the Taj Dome or any of the cathedrals of medieval uh, Europe that have the dome. So what does that state? That whenever there is a vertical force, which are our biting forces in a vertical direction, the purple areas on the tooth, this is the enamel, the white, the enamel shows forces that pass on the forces as oblique. The forces are passed on or the, the forces that are on an enamel are in an oblique direction. And in the dentine core, which is the softer core, takes it in a horizontal direction. So this is how the, the forces are absorbed and are dampened out. 
this is the compression dome concept but most importantly among this is also there are two stress concentration areas one among them is the dej that connects the dentin and the enamel that dampener al allows for forces to go horizontally but again it acts as a stress concentration point because it is a very thin layer that joins the enamel and the dentin but it's very tough and the second concentration area is in the cervical part of the tooth where the enamel is the thinnest but the forces you can see the width of these lines are much thicker and they come much closer even in the dentine as well as the enamel so these are the stress concentration areas that we should be very well aware of and that is what the compression dome concept of force dissipation within the tooth tells us understanding the forces on a tooth also work depends on the number of contacts that we have. So working side is nothing but the functional side, that if you are biting on the right, that is, that's the working side. So when we have multiple contacts, that is two or more, the forces are distributed at much better. But on the same side, if we have just a single contact, we can see that there is a lot more of tensile forces at the cervical area. Okay, you can see the forces compared to this are much, much higher. Even in the enamel, you can see there are tensile forces. The forces are much higher as well as in areas that are much weaker. The same thing if we go to a non-functional side. Okay, we do want non-functional lateral forces. We've always heard of that. What happens is the force multiplier is much, much higher because they are not supposed to be taking vertical forces. But in the on the non-working side, the tension forces are much more. That is the cleavage forces. They force the teeth away from each other. And that's, that's why we have a lot more failures when we have non-working side lateral forces. Whereas you can see this, when we have a clenching force, it's entirely vertical. So the, the forces are very well dissipated. But then again, we can see that there are multiple points of contact. So multiple contacts and working side contacts is what we should try and achieve. Whereas non-working side contacts and single tooth contact is something that we should stay away from. Then comes the biorim and the and the dome. So the compression dome is nothing but it follows the enamel up to the DEJ. And the biorim is based on the height of contour of the tooth. And anything apical to the, bio, the height of contour, which is also uh, termed as the inflection plane, is named as the biorim. Okay, so this is the concept where the biorim is something that needs to be preserved. And this is clinically important because a biorim is something that is not preserved in all our traditional crown cuttings or tooth preparations for a full jacket crown or a full uh, circumferential crown. A biorim, we lose out about 1 mm to 1.5 mm of cervical dentine. So in the areas that the maximum stress is, we take out the most amount of dentine. Uh, in a percentage wise. So that is what a biorim concept tells us that we should be preserving. It is defined as the two to three millimeters of tooth structure located above the CEJ. Okay, so this is where it is. That's why the even in endodontic concepts, you want to go as minimal as possible in the axis cavities because we, we want to preserve most of the cervical dentine and endo axis with uh, axis refinement burrs are no longer uh, done. So the clinical considerations for this is just assessment of the tooth and for understanding four risk factors. The four risk factors are first are cracks. So most of our amalgams which are 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, they may be restored, they may be there. But these are this is how the tooth appears after all these years in service. Amalgam is not something that bonds to the tooth but passes on the tooth in some in the forces onto the tooth that are not acceptable or not the tooth is not meant to take. The inter, the isthmus width, if it is greater than two, two millimeters, again poses a red flag or is a risk area. The cuspal thickness of less than three millimeters and the proximal depth of the box, if it is greater than four millimeters, which in most cases would be uh, for a class two caries. So in these cases, what do we do? We approach such cases with caution and there are certain principles that are mentioned uh, for in biomimetics to, to restore them. Those are stress-reducing protocols. These mean smaller increments of 
uh, is if you're placing composites, smaller increments of composites, okay, do not join uh, uh, adjacent walls or opposite walls. Okay, smaller horizontal increments of composite, placement of fibers. So multiple such stress reducing protocols have been proposed. We go into a crack removal. How do we go in for crack removal? Crack removal is taken up to it's pretty much like a uh, caries removal, where we want a peripheral seal zone without any cracks. Cuspal capping, we'll be discussing that, and going in for indirect restorations to reduce the C, uh, C factor or the stress in the bone. So how do we assess these teeth clinically? This is how we'll go for it. We'll understand that there is a small little crack over here on the proximal restor uh, in the distal side of the tooth. There is an internal extension of the same crack line as we go from the proximal towards the center of the tooth. So these are all red flags. There is enamel loss on one side as well as cohesive fractures. So that also shows that the bite of the patient is extremely high or the forces on his bite is probably clencher or you know night grinder. The isthmus width is definitely more than two millimeters, probably more than three millimeters in this case. The cuspal width. Now the cuspal width is something that is taken not at the tip of the cusp, but at the base of the cusp. So that is only after we remove the entire the restoration we'll be able to measure. But again, this is a risk factor in this case. As soon as the cusp isthmus width increases, we are uh, at risk of uh, you know, cuspal width decrease below 3 mm, which is a vital measurement. We also see in this case that there is a mesial, marg uh, mesial marginal ridge is lost and there is a mesial composite restoration. So once the mesial is lost, the distal is lost and the width of the isthmus is wide. So that makes this tooth extremely sensitive to the mechanical forces. And then again, this is something that we see that is a lingual contact, that is a non-working force contact, uh, non-working side contact. Okay, or one of the non-functional cusps are again in contact. So what does that do? This stress, the patient himself is uh, having uh, extreme forces, the tooth is weakened and the forces on this tooth are extremely non-favorable. So in this case, we would like to go in for as many biomimetic principles as possible to restore it in a predictable manner. So what are the treatment options that we have? It comes from direct composite, whether it's then indirect restorations, Indirect, we have composites as well as onlays. Direct margin elevations, whereas we are reaching root caries or below the CEJ or below the gum level, we are uh, treating caries below that. And then fiber reinforced composites. Understanding the physical properties of dental heart tissues is one thing, but also understanding what materials will correspond or mimic these materials of within the tooth is something that biomimetics follows. Three major uh, material properties or tooth properties, uh, physical properties that we follow are the elastic modulus, the thermal, thermal expansion of coefficient and the tensile strength. And these are within enamel and dentine because of the histologic nature, because of the water content are very, very different. It's about 80 for as the elastic modulus and 14. That's the difference that we have in each of these properties. They're very, very different. And thus we cannot replace both of these materials with both of these structures within the tooth with a single material. And that is where understanding the materials that are available for replacement and using their properties in the way that they should be. For example, ceramics more or less mimic enamel when supported by, uh, by a substructure, whether it be dentine or composites is something that gives us similar properties. Whereas for dentine, a good replacement based on these physical properties are hybrid composites or composites in general. So how do we attain, uh, how do we go about and approach direct composites? So we all know when, when there is in a tooth, when there is enamel and dentine, and we prepare a cavity. This is just an illustrative purpose for a cavity. This is not exactly a cavity preparation class. So we just go in for illustration purposes. And then we place composite. This is how we expect our composite to be. But the truth is that our composite is always shrinking. It shrinks towards the center, especially when placed in larger increments, it shrinks to the center. Why is this happening? First is that composites shrink towards the light source or shrink towards the center, which in this case will be towards the outer part of the cavity or the occlusal surface. 
that creates this gap between enamel and dentine. And this is the source of all the sensitivity in the composites that forms during or after uh, our uh, traditional comp traditionally placed composite restorations. So, and also the enamel bond is very different compared to the dentine bond. What is the difference? The first is that dentine bond forms over time, whereas enamel bond forms faster and also higher immediately. So these are the two differences that we have to understand. And that is why the principles of hierarchy of bond bonding and also multiple incremental placement of composite has come into being. Also understanding the C factor in such a deep cavity is something that we should understand. So C factor is nothing but the ratio of bonded to unbonded surfaces. And in this case, sorry, unbonded to bonded surfaces. And in this case, it is a flat plane will have the least amount of uh, C factor. That is the pulling force away from the hybrid layer or the tooth will be the least. Coming to a small plate will be slightly more, but even much, much lesser than anything that is more than two millimeters or anything that is approaching four to six millimeters. And that is why endodontic cavities, okay, or deep proximal cavities, which are up close, sometimes eight or 10 millimeters have the maximum C factor and also occlusal cavities that is in the post endodontic. So C factors, the, the bare minimum is where we should try and attain. And this is what is attained in the smallest increment of horizontal uh, composite layers. So what do you mean by hierarchy of bonding? A hierarchy of bonding is nothing but a hierarchy, wherein there is someone who is the head that has to be given the most attention. And then as we go down the hierarchy, they may be given least attention. For that, it is this is something that the two concepts that are there is immediate dentin sealing and the resin coat. So what do we mean by immediate dentin sealing and resin coat? And also in the hierarchy, we have to try and bond to dentine first and allow it time for it to uh, get a higher bond. And with that, we come to the concept of decoupling with time. I'll get into some details with each of these concepts. So immediate dentine sealing is pretty much what the term implies. Okay, you As soon as we freshly prepare a cavity, the tubules are open into the cavity space. And because of the pulpal pressure into the uh, open tubules, there is pulpal fluid coming into the cavity. If we immediately apply an adhesive, whether it is a total edge or a self edge method, and we block this out, there is no longer perfusion of a capillary action of the uh, uh, pulpal fluid through the odontoblast or the dentinal tubules into the pulpal cavity. This is immediate dentin sealing. So how do we go about it? We can either go for a total edge or a self edge and we apply it, but only to dentin. Okay, we immediately do it after the uh, after the cavity preparation. Now, the cavity preparation can be for a direct composite. It can be for a tooth prep prepared for any type of indirect restoration, whether it be a tooth uh, onlay or even in cases where uh, a full crown is given. The this is because the the pulpal pressure, the pulpal preservation is high. There is no bacterial influx or pulpal fluid efflux that happens. And that is why the bond is also remains and the vitality of the tooth also remains good. This is the first layer of something called as a biobase and every subsequent layer is a layer above it. Resin coat is again similar to what the name suggests. It is nothing but a resin. It is usually a flowable composite, a microfilled to be more specific. It's about 0.5 millimeters of the resin coat. It's a flowable placed over the flowable composite, sorry, the over the adhesive. So the adhesive forms something called the hybrid layer. Above this hybrid layer, to make it slightly more thicker and stronger, it is what we use as a, is the resin coat. So what does the resin coat do? It, it allows enough strength for that hybrid layer to prevent forces that are pulling it away from dentine. It also acts as an oxygen inhibited layer for thin coats of adhesive. That's a slightly technical term, but uh, it is something that is required. So, so basic composite to sum it up is we, we do an acid etching or a self etch depending on what system you are going in for. 
we apply the adhesive this is mainly only on dentin and deg it does not go on to enamel enamel and dentin are never bonded together in biomimetic dentistry it's always different or at different times timelines and then we after we cure the adhesive we apply 0.5 millimeters that is a thin coat very thin coat with a and then we spread it across the entire dentine with a, a perioprobe so that we know that we are not too thick okay and this this is what the second layer of the biobase is then we go in for the concept called as decoupling with time decoupling with time is nothing but just wait and watch we don't do anything in this because as i said before the bond to dentine takes time to evolve that time is shown to be about 5 minutes and it uh, it forms about 90% of its potential bond strength and 90% of potential bond strength is good enough for us to undertake the future filling procedures so we do the adhesive we place the adhesive we do a small layer of resin coat which is 0.5 mm or flowable composite and after that we, once we cure it we just wait okay this allows for enough time that the uh, graphical representation that i showed you which wherein the dentine is separated from the composite does not happen once we wait for about 5 minutes and following these principles we'll just see a clinical case okay this is a large carious lesion okay the pretty much the entire buccal half it's the lower second molar lower left second molar where we can see the entire buccal half of the tooth is pretty much decayed and we can see the entire dj over here lateral spread of caries and the enamel rim so we just following the same principles we go to a caries removal end point where we see the peripheral seal zone that is completely caries free following the uh, caries detecting dye we just go deeper deeper but up to a point that is say about 3 mm and then not more than 5 mm occlusally then then go for the immediate dentin sealing you can see the bond just bond applied on the dentin itself you can see enamel over here it is not not at all into the zone once that is done we go in for the resin coat 0.5 mm of microfilled resin just over the immediate dentin sealing that is dentin again you can see clean dentin clean dj and then we go in for decoupling with time that is nothing but wait and watch you can have a coffee you can fill in your notes just wait 5 minutes on a timer just wait if if you are doing a proximal restoration probably you can do the matrix band application which which will take you about 2 or 3 minutes and then by the time you place the first layer of the composite it will take you another 2 minutes so you don't need to wait on that but in this case we just had to wait and then we go in for etching of enamel okay this was a patient ideally you would want to go in for a indirect in this but the patient was uh, flying abroad within 3 days and the tooth was showing good signs of vitality so we went in for a direct restoration we go for a we can if there is a little bit of bond that might have flown uh, onto the enamel we can just roughen the enamel and then go in for the selective enamel etch followed by dentin replacement you can see these are small small bits these are in mul done in multiple increment this was probably one increment second increment a third and a fourth and this is now going to cuspal rebuilding okay this is then we go in for the lingual cusps followed by a peripheral buccal rim so this is only enamel etching so i told you right uh, we don't join enamel and dentine as much as possible so that was only enamel that was built freehand okay then we go in by cusp by cusp the mesiobuccal cusp then we go for the distobuccal cusp building not in thick layers okay we go in by multiple small layers and we build it up and this is how we end the restoration loop we are completely occlusally rehabilitated uh, compositely used for rehabilitation of this tooth this is where we started and this is where we done this has been over a year and a half the tooth the patient is doing absolutely fine and this is where the predictability of the bond and the and the composite is in play it's a very deep and wide cavity but absolutely no trouble here's another case a very poorly done composite you can see this is not following any principles of composite not even a matrix band that is applied more a, a you know finger press kind of composite once the composite is removed as expected we have a lot of caries around the tooth and once restored this is again a direct composite restoration just going through the uh, multiple steps uh, within the same uh, previous case 
you can see the proximal box okay we as we go deep we go for a peripheral seal we remove caries all along and the enamel bevel as well and you can see the pink we just let it be over there we don't go any deeper then we go for a the getting into doing a class one and then the occlusal composite into the tooth the same tooth we can see this over here at two years doing absolutely fine the patient has even forgotten which side of the tooth uh, of the mouth that he had had such a cavity this is for me uh, taking a two year recall and as we see the radiographs okay we can see here uh, you know this was very close to the pulp but it was not an exposure we just went ahead with restorative principles and we can see there is again a good amount of dentine that is formed that that may be because of the angulations but you could see the slight changes periapically have also been healed so there is absolutely no uh, change uh, no symptoms or even radiograph signs of deterioration indirect so composites are also a very good option okay for treating cases this can be it's a it's more a uh, you know a cost saving affair because the lab costs can be done you know the, you, as dentists we can ourselves take that up showing you a case this is an endodontically treated tooth which are uh, with a large proximal restoration and trying to restore this tooth this is the these are the margins of the cavity where only the mesial marginal ridge is pretty much intact but the buccal and the lingual cusp or the palatal cusp the upper premolar are pretty much encroached on by the composite or the endodontic cavity itself uh, you can see a wide open contact and trying to restore this clinically uh, because of the contour or trying to form a contour or uh, also you know the bulk of the restoration can be deleterious to the long term success of this tooth okay you can see this the pre op and as we go step by step it's nothing but a you know a simple cavity that is prepared for a uh, the proximal box a cuspal capping which we'll be talking about and the extension of the buccal cavity and here you can see uh, once an impression was taken with alginate this is nothing but a bite registration paste blow flowed into the comp, uh, into the alginate to get a positive replica of the tooth why is this done the silicone does not stick to composite and it's immediate it's just a 2 minute set so chair side we can pretty much do this we fill it up with layers i prefer not bulking it up in one uh, in one go multiple layers over here it gives us better control it barely takes a couple of minutes additional and once we do this okay this is the restoration done outside the mouth okay and then we can easily finish all these margins okay with a disc with a composite finishing disc and then we just go ahead and bond it to the tooth here you can see the before and after so these are indirect composites that act as a good uh, you know the amount of composite that is used there is no force acting on the tooth it's the c factor is reduced because only the resin is then bonding the cementing medium which in this case was uh, dual core uh, resin okay you can use for dual core resins you can use flowable you can use uh, composites itself uh, which are heated composites any of these can be used for cementation coming to onlays onlays require cuspal coverage so i it's i will use a collective term like onlays okay it's something that has been placed onto the tooth okay so what what are the concepts for cuspal coverage as we have concept for pulpal preservation for cuspal coverage there are two uh, measurements that are mentioned which i stick by at the base of the cusp this is that is over here okay over here if we are going in for this cusp it will be at the base of the cusp for a functional cusp that is the lower buccal or the upper palatal it the minimum that should be there is 2 mm okay on a measurement gauge and for the non functional cusp that is the upper buccal and the lower lingual it should be a minimum of 3 mm that is because the non functional cusp have a lot more tension forces that can fracture the cusp much more easily and this concept is called as the bull rule that is buccal of the upper and the lower lingual if they are 3 mm or less they should be capped okay that is we reduce it the occlusal occlusally we reduce it by about 2 to 3 mm how does the reduction go up other than those measurements what else do we follow for cusp reduction if there is unsupported enamel now this is the measurement that is there okay and we just cut it short okay it can be a flat disc it, there are multiple bevels also on enamel that can be placed 
but that is something for a later date. And here you can see there is unsupported enamel. So in this case, this amount of this red box, what the outline of the red box is something that the enamel should be cut short to. And what do we do of the remaining? Now, this is also unsupported. Pretty much till this level, it is unsupported. But we also have to do a preservation of enamel. So in that case, okay, we, we reduce the height of this, the yellow markings, we reduce the height and all the green areas, this is undermined dentine will be filled with composite. Okay, this entire area will be filled with composite and this part will be preserved. As much of this part will be preserved, that will be good because the stress concentration areas, we want enamel to be there because the bonding of enamel to this area will be the highest and most predictable in the long term. Okay, that is the green arrows will be hybridization and uh, use of flowable or fiber reinforced composite. So the cusp reduction as for any indirect process needs to be uniform. It needs to be at least two millimeters, okay, from all uh, aspects at least 1.5 millimeters okay because the uh, the restoration of choice in indirect restorations is in ceramics is emax and we, ideally uh, there are studies that are showing that 1 millimeter could be enough but 1.5 mm is a good clinical principle to go by because uh, sometimes on reduction after cementation, there could be high points. So we don't want to go any thinner than that. So the most critical areas are the inner part. So we usually visualize this, but this part is something that we don't visualize. And also the central pit. Okay, So this is something that we need to have a good depth. So this is the preparation, the cuspal preparation that we're talking about. Coming to a case on this, okay, on a similar onlay with the cusp, cusp thinning out. Okay, just assessment of, the, of, of this tooth clinically, we can see that there is a large composite on this tooth. Okay, that this is the outline of that composite. Okay, that goes right up till here. And it was a proximal composite which has fractured under load. You can see the x-ray of this. Okay, we can again see the same thing. The secondary dentine, we have the enamel margin. And once we take off all the undermined enamel as shown with the yellow and the green arrows, Okay, we take off all the unsupported dentine, uh, unsupported enamel. This is where the cavity is. Okay, we have good peripheral enamel. We've created an open contact for the lab to create a wonderful contact. And since the mesial cusps were uninvolved, we do not touch them. So preservation and non-cusping of marginal ridges as well as unaffected cusps is something that is strongly advocated. We do not need to involve just for the sake of involvement because remember we are using adhesive restorations. Okay, we are using we are going to bond to that tooth, so we don't need retention uh, by mechanical means. This is where we are at. Once we've done the bio base, this is immediately after cavity preparation. Okay, this is with the bio base that is there. That is uh, immediate dentin sealing followed by the resin coat, and then all undermined enamel or just getting a flat surface. We add a after five minutes, we then add composite. Okay, and this is where the prep was. This is the histologic radiographic analysis showing the enamel, the bio base, which is nothing but dentine replacement with immediate dentine sealing and a resin coat. This is the Emax only. Okay, when, when bonded onto the tooth, you can see a good broad contact, okay, and good integration. So this is natural tooth, and this is the replacement. This is so this is what biomimetic dentistry is, preserving what can be preserved and replacing what needs to be preserved and in the multiple layers and multiple materials that are indicated. So this is the same tooth and the radiographic analysis of the before, during and after. This is another interesting case of an onlay, but was done with zirconia. So there was a patient who came in to me with a zirconian, zirconia onlay that was done about two years before, but she was having continuous sensitivity on that tooth. The, I was very surprised to see that, you know, a zirconia only is done, but it was actually done. And once we see this, we, we see probably a problem area over here, but because the radio opacity of zirconia, we couldn't see much. And when we took it off, you can see this, there is a lot of secondary caries that is there under the restoration. And as we go ahead and remove that, we can see that almost the distal half of the tooth is lost because of secondary caries. But at the same time, following the same principles of 
marginal integrity and enamel rim is maintained and you go ahead and just restore this. So this is the resin coat and the bio base that is prepared for the only. And then it's a full coverage only. Okay. Here again, we can see as because there was a restoration and slow progressing carries, we can see a good amount of uh, secondary and tertiary dentine that is formed over there. Now, this is the difference between a zirconia, which is a traditional restoration or an only in this case, and an Emax only. Okay, you, you approach it with the principles of restorative dentistry and biomimetic restorative dentistry. Coming to endotreated teeth, as mentioned, uh, endotreated teeth have much deeper cavities. So in this case, we want to place us, is recommended to place a GIC base because retreatment becomes easy, not for restorative reasons as such, but also it reduces the height and depth of the cavity and composite should be placed uh, over uh, to form a shallow uh, replacement material that is the indirect material should be not as deep as an endocrown endocrown is something that i do not advocate or prefer uh, its composite is a quicker replacement a much cheaper replacement as well and it gives us better uh, form of the tooth uh, to receive a restoration so for endodontic treated teeth this is something that uh, you know had these are two four molars on the upper and four molars on the lower which had very localized attrition. You can see that pretty much no other tooth is attrited, but extreme wear on these molars. And because of the, sh the shape of and the, the size of the cavities, as well as the restorative requirements, we had to go in for endo. And these were then replaced with onlays. There was absolutely no tooth height remaining because of the extent of caries uh, that we could go for anything other than uh, adhesive restorations, which in this case were onlays. We went in for DMEs as well as on this. Coming to DME, okay, that is nothing but deep margin, direct margin, elevation, multiple terms, but it's nothing but getting a cervical margin, which is at this level to something like that is much more easily accessible and uh, isolate, can, you can isolate much more easily. Okay, it's raising that to a equigingival or supragingival region, okay. Multiple techniques are available, you, but there, there needs to be excellent isolation for you to work under that. Rubber dam is a must. In indirect restorations, why is it, why is it something that you do? Because we can then isolate. It's easier to clean the cement. It's easier for us to visualize. And, uh, you know, because there is better isolation, the margins can be, uh, you know, much predictably bonded. And more importantly, this is a one step. It probably takes about about 15 minutes to half an hour and it is a one step you know replacement or uh, alternate to crown lengthening surgery which otherwise has a long morbidity or you know black triangles that can be formed uh, or even the time that has that it takes to allow for a replacement with and studies have shown a pretty high survival rate so how do we go about this pretty much the same principles of root caries the caries removal and then IDS, that is immediate dentin sealing and resin coat. But we do it in a maximum vertical height of 1.5 to 2 millimeters, but multiple layers of 0.5 to 1. And if you want to be as textbook as required, we avoid any contact with the axial wall. So we only want to build the, uh, the height of the tooth without touching the axial wall. Coming to fiber reinforced composites, this is something that, again, within the composites itself, play an important role to reduce the polymerization shrinkage within the tooth, uh, within the composite itself. So the forces are not uh, directed towards the hybrid layer. What are the options that we have? This is a composite that has fibers intrinsically woven within the resin itself. This is Everex posterior, comes from GC. And this is a wonderful material to, repl to replace posterior. It's not the only one, uh, but there are multiple such materials that are there. The other is nothing but a rebond which is interwoven mesh-like fibers that help in dissipating the, uh, the forces, the occlusal or the stress that has passed on to the tooth. So it is something like a DEJ that acts to dissipate the vertical forces into a horizontal area. So this is a case uh, for post-endodontic. You can see something that the white area, okay, the deep endodontic cavity, this is wallpapering. This is referred to as rebound wallpapering. The rebound is placed in a circumferential way. 
that is why it is referred to as wallpapering and then a vertical or a horizontal was placed after the vertical a horizontal as a pulpal floor or you can say a ribbon roof for this restoration followed by composite so this is never exposed to the uh, oral cavity even in after prep so it should always be covered on either side by uh, composite material ribbon is also used as just for core in this case uh, this was a lateral incisor where uh, you can use it as a core supporting uh, material the same thing can be used it can be used for the a post and core that is uh, ribbon wallpapering and placed into the into the root to give good support for the core coming to the key takeaways okay coming to the conclusion of the lecture i must say that caries detecting dyes are the cheapest and the best alternatives to go into minimal invasive or biomimetic restoration the number of times you can get overconfident in uh, you know saying that your cavity is now caries free and once you place this caries detecting dye you will be surprised and by the amount of caries that still shows up because no longer can caries be detected visually or by tactile sensations we have to use chemicals that are proven to sh to be specific to detecting caries pulpal preservation should always be one of the top priorities at all times immediate dentin sealing and resin coat if there is one takeaway that i would suggest for all clinicians it would be this immediate dentin sealing and resin coating uh, do this for all cavities uh, once you expose dentin this is something that you should be doing cuspal capping just to sum it up minimum thickness required for functional cusps that is uh, the lower buccal and the upper palatal should be at the base should be 2 mm and 3 mm if it's a non functional that is the bull concept there are multiple alternatives to direct composite indirect composite semi direct composite where a teflon is also placed and you can just cure it and then you know additionally cure it into the uh, extra orally and then bond it or ceramic bonded restorations and fibers for stress reduction okay uh, whether we use ribbon or whether we use composites that have certain fibers that allow that these are all uh, you know much better alternatives to the regular high, micro hybrid or nano hybrid composites so at the at the start of the uh, you know the lecture i discussed certain advantages those were technical advantages that i mentioned to you but i feel the most advantages part of biomimetic dentistry are the the predictability of the restorations that can be done i no longer you know feel the need of you know to fret over will this restoration come out of with this debond will the patient have sensitivity you know any of that there will be no staining nothing i have shown you to your follow ups i'm sure these will last for a lot longer uh, and that builds up professional confidence you know confidence in your own work that itself is a practice builder you will be doing a lot more restorations you will be able to charge a lot more of course it will take a little time there is a learning curve but the, at the end of it you will definitely doing a much better job and all of this is based on evidence it is not something that you know it is there since a year it is tried tried by me or tried by you uh, some others you know it's it's not anecdotal evidence it is good enough evidence from you know multiple studies independent studies done across 20 25 years that have been taken together and it's the foundation to build on for long term success i think this is something that is the key and that is why it has formed you know it's it's like a rage biomimetic dentistry uh, or restorative dentistry in this case what we are talking about uh, is the rage towards uh, you know it's something that is catching on uh, you know it's it's not the marketing only there is you know a lot of strength in the concepts underlying of course it's an evolving science there will be better evidence that comes in the future but this is a very good foundation that we form on to end up i would like to take up a case uh, just present a case this is a, a very interesting case and showing you the advantages of bio dent uh, biomimetic dentistry he is a fellow dentist in fact a fellow colleague where uh, i would go at one point of time for a consulting for endodontics and uh, you know he came up to me saying that you know i've been having a filling for a couple of months and uh, uh, he he had done a class 2 with another dentist and you know that kept giving him sensitivity kept giving him sensitivity 
and ultimately it went in for a root canal treatment and uh, he's like now not only is you know that giving me trouble but even the opposing side uh, you know by the time the root canal was done even the opposing side gave, gave him trouble so this is the point at which i seen him so this is the the right side this is an upper molar the right side which uh, was rc treated okay we can see a distal composite that was done and on removal of the temporary restoration this is what we see so is this something that should be done i don't know it it could have been avoided if i according to me once the cavity was cleaned we could see that you know it's a, it was a pretty large composite with there with there was a small crack that was here that was part of the restoration uh, it wasn't cleaned so that is what was probably giving him the pulpal sensation and it was only sensitivity because he being a dentist he gave very clear history and uh, ultimately we had to go in for an only for this case because you could see that you know because of the crack and thinning out of the cusp because of the you know non uh, it was not a minimalist act, access cavity uh, so we had to go in for an only on this cusping uh, uh, capping of all cusps now going to the other side okay he same complaint you know persistent sensitivity in fact this is what he came in came to me for when i opened up it was a class 1 there was a class 1 that was there but as you go under the microscope and you see this you could see a crack that is forming over here okay there was a, a crack on the distal surface now this is the left side as we went chasing the crack you can see how broad the contact is okay and you can see the crack and now this crack is going horizontally into the tooth that's where as it flexes you know every time he chewed on it or you know every time that there was contact the cusp of flux flexing and this crack is what was causing the sensitivity you go ahead you know chase the crack and once you dissect it you just go ahead and fill it up so what was done over here with a composite restoration and he's absolutely fine with following the principles of biomimetic restoration okay this is not the end cavity that was there it was of course finished and the crack was completely removed but this is this is the tooth that has you know the, imagine the morbidity and the cost to the patient okay this is one restoration that has served well it's been over a year now uh, that the tooth is doing absolutely fine and exactly probably the same case on the other side went in for a root canal treatment and had to be cusp uh, cusp capped in that case okay so i would end with with this saying that thanks for you all to to be here uh, that you all have been an audience that is you know on a quest for knowledge and there is absolutely no substitute for knowledge biomimetic restorative dentistry is something that is evolving uh, and there will be a lot of things that will be showing and more long term data that would be coming but this is very credible data that we have for the future that is something that i could that i would definitely say i think uh, instagram is all with 21 year olds show us how you are 21 this is probably somewhere around that time if not really 21 maybe the early 20 this is our first year of mds where we are all smiles this is uh, my batch mates over there uh, jojo and anuj and uh, three of the girls sonal sushmita and anuradha this was our department and uh, i must say a big thank you to this entire department all my pgs all my seniors and the juniors and the wonderful staff that were there uh, you know that that has been the foundation for uh, where me as an individual me as a clinician uh you know me as a person everything i am i am today this is us uh, you know all in our ties and uh, with our name plates on the last day of mds where the all the examiners are discussing what do we do with them and probably counting our marks or something of that sort we found the best time to take a photograph on that day okay and this is somewhere around uh 2011 early 2011 and lastly i would like to thank uh, along with all my senior staff and faculty uh you know pascal magne and david alman they have been pioneers they have started a movement they have they are exceptional uh, teachers uh, very passionate teachers who want to spread the message and they have the right means to do it uh, and their literature i mean the way the way they've gone about systematically approaching these are multiple jigsaw puzzles that they have had to you know try and decipher for us and that they've provided us uh, as clinicians one more week i had the uh, you know um, the opportunity to meet him uh, earlier uh, late last year in december in kolkata where he was here for a conference and uh, listen to his lectures and the work and you know the concepts that he made clear for me was were amazing a lot of those uh, you know 
Instagram kings and queens, I call them, because they are they do such wonderful work. They are you know sharing it so openly, uh, inspiring us and allowing us to learn as well. You know there is there is a lot to learn in even small concepts where you know clinically you may have not thought of it or you know it, something that is there at the back of your mind comes in the front once you discuss share uh, uh, your clinical cases and this is the whole idea of this lecture today as well where my work or my concepts can help you in your restorative journey the many scientific researchers who have taken the tough tasks of you know uh, finding evidence towards the uh, the concepts that have been proposed or, you know, finding contrary evidence to, to concepts that should be shunned. I think they're doing a wonderful job, which we should uh, give them kudos to. And uh, finally, my friends, Disha Agarwal and Jojo Kotur, who we've had multiple discussions, you know, we've had detailed discussions. We've, I've probably racked their brains over a lot of concepts, but uh, they've been ever patient and uh, a wonderful audience to discuss with at all times. So thanks to them as well. Okay. Uh, just to give you a little uh, introduction to the, the academy and the courses that I have, uh, we have a couple of courses for uh, aesthetics in composite and advanced restorations, which is all about biomimetic restorations and, you know, uh, more about DMEs and, uh, you know, post and codes and stuff like that. Uh, also in rubber, damo rubber damology. And uh, a couple of endodontic courses, uh, one in clinical endodontics, which is more of basics and fundamentals course and advanced endodontics for, you know, retreatments or instrument retrievals and stuff. So those who are interested in uh, hearing from me could probably buzz me out on Instagram or, or Facebook or even send in a short mail. Yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so much, sir. It was an eye opener, actually. <laughs> So, okay, so we will have a question and answer session and I would request the audience, please post your question, which is actually relevant to the topic. So, yeah, I think we have few questions here, sir. Okay. Okay, so uh, there's one question regarding about rebound. So when you're applying the rebound, is it done during the immediate dentin sealing or is it done after the immediate dentin sealing? Uh, so rebond is a layer of the bio base. So the bio base, as we come from the tooth towards the occlusal surface, is the adhesive followed by a resin coat. Now rebond application can be done above the resin coat. It is not part of the immediate dentine sealing, and it will never be in contact with the tooth itself. So above the resin coat, it is, and you know, in it can even form a part of the distended working time or decoupling with time. Wherein it will take you that much time to place the fibers. You know, it's not the easiest to uh, manipulate, especially into that small little cavity. It will keep dancing here and there. It may stick to the instrument. It will not stay in place, things like that. So you play it, place it in a little bit of adhesive or flowable, and then you cover it with another layer of uh, flowable or composite. So, or it can even be used. You can use APX or you know multiple composite uh, fiber reinforced composites over it. So it's not placed on the tooth. It's never in contact with the tooth. So in case of uh, in case there's an accidental exposure and uh, we have to cap cap with the MTA material, and do we need to place GAC over the MTA or do we have can we follow the biometric procedure? Can we directly uh, place composites? So as shown, even in the case with uh, that I had shown of a pulpal exposure. So MTA, you cannot really place it at that pinpoint. So a lot of your dentine is then covered by MTA. So that is also a reason why you don't want to be having a pulpal exposure because your dentine bond is something that you are going to depend on. That is first. Uh, either GIC or that is because you want to protect the MTA from any uh, trauma of the restorative material like you want, you don't want to, to get washed out as such. Or you can even do a self-adhesive uh, self or self-etch you know, over it. So there's no technical reason because you're not going to really bond over it. There's no bond that is going to happen towards the uh, MTA as such. There are enough studies that are showing that it is a decent bond because even then, then you're going to go for a peripheral seal. So that is something that you're going to depend on. And that MTA, which is then in direct contact with the pulpal tissue with a, will form a uh, dentine barrier or a hydroxy appetite layer. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Okay, sir. So um, 
Yeah, I think we have one question regarding about selecting edge. Do we need to do a selective edge or do we need to do a total edge method in biomimetics? Uh, so the total edge method is something that can be done, but uh, it is preferable to be kept done with OptiBond FL because of the thickness of the bond that is there. Because otherwise the etchant on dentine can go very deep and uh, the bonds may not reach the, the adhesive may not go that deep. Uh, so it's in today's day, it is preferred that dentine be self-etched and, uh, and the enamel be uh, etched by a phosphoric acid. So it's a selective etch uh, method that I would recommend. So since the time is constrained and we, I think we'll try to wind up this session, sir. Uh, sure. So if anybody has any questions regarding about the topic, we can definitely, sir, has his own Instagram page where you can contact and you can see his uh, amazing works as well. And if anybody, oh, and you can also uh, post your questions in our WhatsApp group so that all the answers will be rectified. So thank you so much, sir, for sharing your knowledge and expertise when it comes towards biomimetic dentistry. Surely many of us would leave this discussion with amazing takeaway points and implement techniques as per discussed. So thanks to all the doctors for patient listening and for your part mm -hmm. participation for this webinar. And I hope all of you will depart this session with positive, confident manner. So once again, sir, thank you so much. It's a, it was actually a great eye-opener towards the biometric dentistry. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for the audience for staying on all this while. And uh, you know, I hope that practice, you put all these ideas into practice from tomorrow itself. Definitely, sir. We really appreciate your valuable time given for us for this series episode, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. So to know more about our upcoming webinars and workshops, please do check out our Facebook and Instagram pages. And anyone who has missed out our previous webinars, you can do check out our YouTube channel as well. So I would request the audience to please do subscribe our channel as well. So thank you all and have a great night. Good night.